So let's say I have a master slave architecture since Hadoop works on a master slave architecture, right? I'm just taking a real world scenario just to understand what is MapReduce, how it works, okay? So let's say you take an example of any company, all right? You have, you know, any team where you have managers and developers working as a team, correct? So basically I'm going to help you understand how MapReduce is designed, what principle it follows, right? And we are just taking a real world practical example just to understand that first. So let's say you have a manager and one developer in a team, right? This is a manager, this is let's say a developer in a team and both there are only two people in the team. Now let's say there is a project requirement that comes to you where manager has to basically you know uh, develop some hands-on project. So what he does, let's say that project would probably take about a four months time, okay? Assuming that the requirements and everything is gathered and they have done this analysis, it takes about four months time. So if he has only one developer, right, obviously managers don't work, we know that. So obviously, you know, developer has to do all the job and in that case, only one developer will take four months to complete this work, right? Now instead of that, if the manager hires four different developers, right? So you have developer one, developer two, developer 3 and developer 4 okay so if you have four developers now if you can divide this work among four developers right so I'll just say work 1 is being given to developer 1 work 2 work 3 and work 4 okay so basically he has just divided the entire project into four parts and given to the different developers now once this task work has been assigned to different developers, obviously assuming that the skills and the knowledge and the efficiency of all the developers are same, in that case, all of them can parallelly work, can parallelly complete this work, right? And that would be one month, right? In one month they can complete this work. Each one of them can, let's say, generate that in the in intermediate output, output 1, output 2, output 3, and output 4, right? So once you have the intermediate output generated, after that, what manager can do is he can actually, you know, still you have not yet solved the entire project right we have uh, still we wanted to basically uh, complete the entire project by integrating this output right so what manager thinks is okay let me ask one of my senior developer to do this integration job so let's say he assigns this work of integration to dev developer 2 he may be a senior developer he will take up all this work right aggregate the output and probably final output whatever he generates it may be given to the client or stored in the some storage system right so that's how typically high level any team would work right so what we have done here is we got the big project we have divided that work into smaller problems smaller parts that big problem is divided into smaller problems and each smaller problem is allocated to different different individuals to work on that. Now since we have allocated it to different individuals and they are not dependent on each other, they can parallelly work on solving that smaller problems and that is what has happened here. They have generated the intermediate output and then finally they have combined the output and generated a final output and that is what we can ship it to the client right so what we have done is something called divide and conquer strategy right we have first divided the bigger problem into smaller chunks and then we have basically solved them parallelly in a distributed way and then we have just combined the output right so this principle is used 
by the way this principle is called divide and conquer and this principle is used in in MapReduce framework so this entire process that we have understood is called MapReduce framework right and I'm sure you know this but I just wanted to quickly set the expectation that this is how the MapReduce works and here I have just taken the real world example of manager and developer so that we can easily relate that right now I will take it to the more technical level now we will discuss about the architecture of MapReduce so we can easily understand it okay so I'll first cover the problems with Hadoop 1.0 once you understand the problem you can better appreciate okay what are the enhancements that I've done as part of Hadoop 2.0 and then we get into the Hadoop 2.0 cluster architecture. We understand uh, YAN, which is called yet another resource negotiator, right? That's where we understand the entire architecture of YAN and how a MapReduce job gets executed into the YAN. So let us start that. So what were the problems in Hadoop 1.0? So if you see here, uh, the problems were the first problem was name node no horizontal scalability right since you know about Hadoop 1.0 there was a master slave architecture where master process is called name node and slave processes are called data nodes right if you see like this these are called data nodes but there was only always a single name node available which is called uh, the master node you have a secondary name node but it is not a backup of the name node so in case if the name node fails which is actually keeping all the metadata information in memory if the name node fails then you don't have any backup node available and then entire cluster is unavailable entire cluster is unreachable even if the single process fails that is why it is called no high availability also it covers no horizontal scalability because in Hadoop 1.0 it does not have a support where I can add one more name node and I can call him as a backup name node and which can be integrated like this okay it is not possible Hadoop 1.0 framework was not having that flexibility to add one more name node in this architecture that is why it is called no horizontal scalability so the single name node single name space unlimited by name node RAM and since you have no high availability it is called single point of failure so if name node fails you need to the entire cluster is unavailable you need to restart it then you need to do the manual recovery using secondary name node for loading all the metadata information you need to restart the name node and then again it would start serving the cluster so basically that's the bigger problem we wanted to solve that is one big issue another issue is called job tracker overburden which means since you all you know already the architecture of map reduce if I have to draw this uh, again you have you know single job tracker and multiple task trackers right this is your job tracker these are multiple task trackers now once you assign let's say if I run 100 MapReduce programs on this cluster all the 100 MapReduce programs will be converted into mappers and reducers right you may have map 1, map 2, map 3 all the mappers are running here you may have reducer 1 running here you may have reducer 2 running here and again all the MapReduce jobs will be converted into different mappers and reducers so there is only single process called job tracker who is managing the entire life cycle of all the MapReduce programs, right? He is the one who has to decide how many mappers to be created, which mapper should be assigned to which uh, task tracker, and stuff like that, right? And also uh, manage everything. So what we were discussing is basically, uh, since you have a job tracker and different task trackers, right? And since the same job tracker was handling the load of managing all the different MapReduce programs, he also needs to make sure that all the mappers of the same MapReduce programs gets executed successfully. If one of the mapper fails, he also needs to take care of the failures, right? to make sure if the one mapper fails here he will go and assign the, the, the execution of the same mapper to some other task tracker wherever the same data block exists and that way the failure also has to be managed 
and the same case with the task tracker failure. If one of the task tracker fails, then also job tracker has to handle that failure accordingly. Right? So lot of activities were given to only single process and that is why we can safely say that the, our job tracker was overburdened. Okay? And that is what I'm going to, uh, that is what I'm emphasizing here. Uh, so basically, Job tracker was overburdened, spent significant portion of the time and effort managing the life cycle of applications, right? Now, that was another issue. After that, one more issue if you notice, Hadoop 1.0 will give you, basically Hadoop framework will give you two important features. One is to store the data in a distributed manner, right? And once you store it in a distributed manner, you can also process it in a distributed manner, okay? So, storage part is covered using SDFS and the processing part is covered using MapReduce. But if you see here, in Hadoop 1.0, it always mandates you to write MapReduce program if you want to process data which is stored on the Hadoop framework, right? Which means only mappers and reduce tasks were allowed, right? Even if you, let's say, want to write Hive query or pick scripts, since you know that, it would automatically convert that into the MapReduce programs and then execute it as a MapReduce program. So ultimately, everything that you execute, you process on the data which is stored on Hadoop 1.0 cluster, will definitely have to be converted as a MapReduce and then only you can process the data. So that is kind of a limitation. Only Map and Reduce tasks are allowed. But what if, let's say, you have already designed a beautiful framework which allows you to store data in a distributed manner. Can we not leverage the, you know, power of different types of processing techniques rather than just relying on only map reduce technique? That was the, I would say, the limitation that uh, people thought. And in fact, Yahoo has actually, Yahoo is the one who developed YARN framework and they were the one who identified these problems initially. So they thought let us do something, let us try to build a framework which allows you to execute not only MapReduce but any type of distributed processing tech programs on the Hadoop cluster. Right? So we will understand now the solution for all these problems. So these are the four problems which were which are I would say a key problems which were existed in Hadoop 1.0 and that is where there was a need to develop Hadoop 2.0 version which could have the features which can solve these issues. These are just a pictorial representation of what we wanted to understand like name node, no high availability and no scalability. You already understand this, right? So one name node goes down, you don't have any backup name node and hence the entire cluster goes down, right? And then you have job tracker overburden, then you have unutilized data in SDFS because you are allowed to execute only using MapReduce programs. So before we get into the solution piece and understand the YARN, we also cover the cluster architecture. So now in Hadoop 2.0, this is how your overall cluster looks like, right? Uh, so I told you that Hadoop basically gives you the storage part handled by SDFS and the processing part now in Hadoop 2.0 is handled by YAM. So that's why there are two branches, right? If you see here, okay? So there are two, two branches and basically what we need to do is, so what happens here is you have these two branches, one is SDFS, another one is YAM and in SDFS you can see now we don't have only single name node but we have multiple name nodes. So there is an active name node, right? And there is a standby name node, okay? Earlier we used to have only active name node available. There was definitely secondary name node and you, I'm, I'm assuming that you understand that these processes were useful in doing the checkpointing, right? And periodically making sure that the metadata information gets up to date and stored in the physical file system. But apart from that, now you are also bringing one more name node called standby name node. Now, having said that, don't assume that it is just two name nodes. You can have as many number of name nodes as you want in Hadoop 2.0 cluster, right? So it depends on the requirement and the configurations. Now, if you see here, the, all these two processes are 
interconnected. That means all the data nodes are connected to both the name nodes. Assuming that there are only two name nodes in this architecture, all the data nodes that are available, both are connected to active as well as standby name node. Right? And similarly, active and standby name node both are actually storing their metadata information in a shared edit logs and metadata information so that they both will have a up-to-date information, metadata information about the entire cluster. Right? So in case if active name node goes down, you still have someone as a backup who already have the knowledge about the cluster and it can directly fail over to the standby name node and it can start serving the cluster because it already knows the metadata information. And that is the important change that has been brought into to make sure that the name node high availability is there. You will not have never have a single point of failure. So that is a one major change with respect to SDFS. And people call it SDFS 2.0 also. With respect to YARN, which is about processing of the data, processing framework, right? So earlier there was MapReduce. Some people call it as next generation MapReduce, but it is basically, you know, the next generation of, I would say, processing framework, not the MapReduce framework. Why? Because it allows you to write distributed processing programs in languages other than MapReduce, not only MapReduce, okay? We will understand more in detail about this architecture in going forward, right? So right now, let us just assume that there is something called YARN, which will be, which is basically an enhancement to the existing MapReduce framework, right? So this is how the cluster architecture looks like. So let us now move forward to the YARN uh, part. If you can see from this diagram, what you can see here is you have SDFS, which takes care of the data, right? Now it is SDFS2. You have YARN, which is a middle layer, which basically converts all your queries and, you know, APIs and programs, all the distributed processing programs into its own native framework and then execute it distributedly on the SDFS, where the data is stored. But here, if you can see, you can execute MapReduce programs the way you used to execute it on your Hadoop 1.0 framework. Also you can execute edge based queries, the storm queries, giraffe algorithms, there are these are called graph theory algorithms. Park, one of the most hot keyword, hot buzzword these days in the market, which is called in memory map reduce programs. Okay? Which is X times faster than existing MapReduce programs, okay? And you have all the, a lot of other uh, distributed programs supporting, right? So having YARN on Hadoop 2.0 can abstract out all the complexities. It is not mandatory for you to convert everything into MapReduce. You just write a map a distributed programs which can be supported by YARN, that's it. Now YARN will take care of converting it into the native format and then execute it. Okay, so this is how a high-level cluster looks like using YARN. 